Thank you, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, so I'm headquartered in Austin, Texas. Happens to be the headquarters of SolarWinds as well. So I'm going to start with a little bit of kind of the story of the SolarWinds hack. So December 12th was a Saturday. Uh, I remember I got a call from our general counsel at about 9, 10 a.m. in the morning saying, hey, I just got a report from FireEye. Uh, the FireEye CEO had called our CEO and said, you have shipped tainted code. Okay, so a nightmare event for any CISO. Um, so basically what happened after that is I talked to the CTO for FireEye, and, and they gave us enough information to really start and understand that, yes, it was true. Now, since we're a C-sharp application, or Orion's a C-sharp application, you can decompile it. And so when you can decompile the code, you can actually see, hey, this code in here did not belong to us. So that was kind of where it started. So with that, we had to go through a lot of different investigations. The investigations themselves took about six months of investigation. Um, you know, first off, uh, legal teams come in. You get legal teams involved. You get external counsel in. You assign a quarterback and a coordinator for things. Um, but Investigation, um, you know, we had CrowdStrike come in from a threat hunt perspective. We had KPMG forensics team come in from a code perspective. CrowdStrike, fantastic threat hunters, but they didn't understand development enough to be able to help diagnose what happened. So all of this is going on on Saturday. We're getting the right people in, uh, trying to build up the, the right team to be there. Um, the question of time is, you know, why do we have to rush so fast, right? So press had, um, when FireEye informed us, they also informed us that press was planning to, you know, announce this on Sunday. So we had a day to be able to figure out a lot of things. And, you know, um, fast forward a little bit forward, and we, we know that the threat actor was the Russian SVR. That was attributed by the U.S. as well as uh, some other researchers. We know that um, the code did not get inserted into our source control system, but got inserted into the build pipeline, into transient virtual machines that run as part of the build. So as we're building the Ryan, it builds like 14 products, takes hours. So um, as part of that, yeah, we go through a build process, we start up a virtual machine, anywhere between 10 and 30 are running at any one point in time. They inserted their code right into one of those virtual machines or transient virtual machine. So everything that the threat actor did was very much to not to be discovered. So very mission centric. They were extremely quiet in what they did in, in my environment. You know, they started by compromising email uh, and that happened you know, about a year before. They compromised email. Office 365. Um, Office 365 has a, um, we'll call it a feature, not a vulnerability, but allows for something called an illicit consent grant to be defined. So Microsoft said we were one of 60 that when they first testified to Congress. They later said we were one of 250 entities that had this model implemented against them. With that, they were able to do investigation of the environment. So very quiet, very stealthy, did investigation in the environment. Um, one of the reasons people say there were 1,000 people behind the attack is because they were taking actions based on the content of email. So I would send an email about a certain subject, and they would take action. We could see they would add additional people to their watch list. Now, so with that level of investigation, yeah, they really were quiet in the environment. They got into the environment, they got email going, they did discovery for a period of time, then they came up, and in October, they did a test run. The October test run had no code in it, simply had a return. So called a function, simply returned. We shipped one product in that October build uh, time frame. Then they came back three months later with about 2,500 lines of code, and that 2,500 lines of code was extremely, you know, it was novel in what it did. Lots of, um, lots of good write-ups on the code that they dropped, but that was a sunburst code. So the sunburst code, you know, waited for 20, 14 days before it would start. 
so people wouldn't find it right away. Wouldn't run in certain environments. So wouldn't run in my test environment, wouldn't run in others, uh, wouldn't run in my production environment. So tried not to run in those, those environments. Um, so a lot of stealth put into the code itself to be able to be not detected. Um, so March, they came back with 2,500 lines of code. Then they removed it all in June. And they went away in June. So they came into our environment, figured out the environment, inserted, inserted a test run, figured out that it worked, came back, inserted 2,500 lines of code that didn't change until they removed it in June. So, um, so what, what occurred? So we ended up shipping to people that downloaded the product. So people that downloaded the product was about 18,000. So when we were looking at the how do we announce what went on, we were, we were focused on um, the maximum number possible that could have been affected. Now, it turned out that that number was actually um, a lot less that were truly affected by this. Um, it truly went to stage two. The code that was written required you to be able to talk to a command and control server. So with that, a lot of our customers had configured their network, so their Orion, which is network control software, would not talk out to the open internet. It would only talk to update.solowins.com. So, but some did. So that was really the affected people. Um, and that was a, under 100 or so um, went to that stage two. So what, um, what I'm going to take you through is really the, the days, the weeks, and the months following that attack. So you can get a sense of what went on. You can get a sense of the intricacies to this. A lot of research and a lot of great articles are done on the code that was dropped and other things. Another thing is why it was called a supply chain attack. It's called a supply chain attack originally because it happened within our supply chain and did not happen to our source control system. Um, but then it became a supply chain attack globally because we, as Orion, were embedded into systems and embedded into systems for many customers. So um, let's talk a little bit about the days. So first days, um, controlled chaos. We learned as much as we could, as quickly as we could, to be able to get information out. Um, the first days are uh, full of investigation. First days are trying to figure out what we can publish. Again, as a public company, we needed to come out with statements before the stock market opened on Monday. So at that point in time, we were able to tell sophisticated attack. We were able to tell the maximum number of, uh, of users that were affected. We were able to tell that um, it was well-crafted in a sophisticated campaign. We didn't know what the end, end kind of target was. Um, fast forward to, to now, and we believe that the you know, threat actor started with the targets, and then we were a route to those targets. So they said, I'm going to go after Agency X. Oh, Agency X happens to have Orion internet facing. Okay, so if we could affect that, we could get um, privileged access within that environment. So the code that was dropped allowed for privileged access to the machine that Orion was running. That's what it did. Um, so Saturday morning, uh, we involved FBI very quickly. We were invo in involved um, CISA uh, pretty quickly. Um, and you know what we were looking for is how to explain what was going on in the right way and explain what customers should do. So although it affected us this weekend, you know, every company in the world was investigating. Every company in the world had their you know, Christmas and New Year's ruined because they had to be able to figure out, am I running SolarWin? Where is it running? What do we have to do? So yeah, never forget your customers in this type of uh, scenario because they're going through as much as you are. Three builds produced, um, and we knew there. So what are the lessons? So it's beyond intense the first days. Um, it is uh, really incredible. So we're there at 6 in the morning until around 2 AM. Um, I actually drove home the first night. It was dur during the middle of COVID. We attempted to do things remote day one on Saturday. 
Uh, Sunday, we all came into the office, or everybody that was local um, came into the office, and we essentially set up war rooms in different, different areas. Um, time is really critical because you have to get information out and you have to be able to say, here's what I know, here's what I don't know. So it's critical to be able to put information out but make it accurate. One of the things that, you know, that 18,000 number, we wish it was 100. We wish and knew it was 100 back then, but by saying 18,000, we didn't come back and forth all the time with new numbers. So it was important to do that. Um, a single team cannot manage response alone. Uh, that's a, an important one, that A, if you attempt to do it, or if I attempted to do it as a CISO and run this whole thing, it would have been impossible, right? Your pressure is to go in different directions, in different areas, and really be able to effectively manage an incident at this scale is um, almost impossible without help. Um, you know, our help came from a... Um, unlikely source, one that I didn't really expect. So we use DLA Piper as our global uh, legal firm and our external legal counsel. They're one of the largest or the largest legal firm in the world. But their forensics team was top notch. They'd been through these types of events in many ways, a lot of ex-FBI folks and other things. So they came in and really act as a, as a coordinator for a lot of things. And I think we'll talk about that in the, the weeks ahead. But first day is just beyond intense and be prepared. It's not gonna stop, right? This is just day one, day two, day three. The weeks ahead are just as bad. So the weeks. Um, we organize into multiple streams. So important to be able to organize between multiple environments because this type of an event says, well, how did they get in, right? So I need my IT group to start discovering how they got in. Then, how did they get into the code? What did they do in the code? How come we're not finding them in source code? Where is the code that they, that they put in? Because again, being decompiled C sharp, I could figure out that these three versions had that code in it. I just decompiled myself, I found it. But I didn't know how it got in there. So engineering, um, marketing communications, we have to be out there communicating to everyone. And the nations of the world are calling you. Yes, nations can call you. Um, and nations of the world called. Every um, national defender called. Everybody with an important program called. Uh, remember, we're right in the middle of creating um, the COVID vaccines. So that was a big concern for governments. It's anybody that's working on the COVID vaccine running a tainted version. That was one of the big questions we were getting. So we're pulling data all the time. Uh, law enforcement, um, FBI is involved. FBI were pushing a lot of content to. We were not at all um, involved in uh, retribution or attribution of the threat actor. We simply fed data in and we have other things to take care of. Other people were looking at who is this threat actor? What are they doing? How can they attribute the attack to a certain entity? Um, so he engaged some additional help, uh, Krebs Stamos Cruz. So Chris Krebs was a former director of CISA, but he gave us those contacts for the national defenders across the globe, and we are working with them as well. Each of the national defenders have a slightly different mechanism, but they're all looking at the same thing. Now, they are trying to amplify the truth. They're trying to get their constituents safe. I can't say that for every third party out there during this type of um, event. So researchers, fantastic researchers, fantastic amount of information coming. Um, but what they're also doing is building names for themselves. So you have to remember there's different motivations going on, um, different people coming in to get attached to the incident um, because it's that type of thing. Um, let's see. Yeah, the, um, we were focused really on communicating with the customers and trying to help them understand, hey, you're safe or you're in trouble or you need additional data um, or you know, in some cases we need to help them get off a one version to another version. So we put programs in place to really do that. So what were the lessons from the weeks? 
Um, <laughs> you will be outnumbered, outmarketed, outcommunicated, and misinformation will be everywhere. So, no, my offices did not get raided by the FBI. No, I did not fix the election. Um, I wasn't responsible for global warming. No, um, it just there's misinformation everywhere. Now, the reason why there's so much of misinformation, um, just so folks are aware, when you're in this event, type of event, you're not going to talk to the press. Right? You're doing so many other things. You're not going to be out there talking to the press. So what does the press do? They fill a vacuum. Um, you know, a lot of the information they had came from you know, people that were in, in, um, at Soloins four years prior, five years prior. So you can imagine security programs five years ago before I got there. So a lot of the information that they got, what information they latched on to were, you know, ex-employees that could talk to them, that would talk to them. So nothing against press, it just is what it is at that point in time. And, you know, bad news is always better than good news. So they're pushing bad news in the press. Um, yeah, remember the impact on others, right? Remember that, you know, as you're going through this, the impact on others is huge. So make sure you're aware of that, make sure you understand that, make sure you're ready for that. Um, create escalation models for each focus area. So basically we had those focus areas. We all got together at 10 o'clock every night. We discussed what we were doing. We discussed where we were. Um, through these things, you know, why don't you get any sleep? Right? One of the reasons you don't get any sleep is you're doing things like talking to the largest customers of the world, you're talking to governments, you're talking to FBI, you're talking to CISA, all during the normal working hours. At night, you're reviewing documents to make sure that everything we say is exactly correct and spot on. So that's what you do until like two or three in the morning is do documents. Then you wake up the next day and do it all over again. So that's kind of the first weeks. Um, don't fight the small stuff. If we had tried to fight every bad piece of press, every bad set of information, um, every you know, misinformation, we would have just spent our time doing that. We wouldn't have spent the time with you know, getting the customers in the right play. Um, yeah, investigations take time. Uh, be patient, uh, be aggressive. Um, but try not to miss things and try not to spread incorrect information to it. Um, and really grow a hard shell because, you know, if I read everything or cared about everything that all the bad things people were saying about me during the first weeks, you know, that would have been, um, it, that would, wouldn't have helped, right? So you really, as a company, as individuals, you have to grow a hard shell to this type of thing. So what's next? The months. Um, we continued with, you know, CrowdStrike working on uh, digging into every piece of our environment for five months. The investigation really lasted about five months. And, of course, they find stuff. You know, think about somebody running around in your environment. They find things. As soon as they find things, we investigate them. We would make changes. Uh, we tighten down our environment, tighten down our IT infrastructure, tighten down everything that, that we see. Um, they, you know, find things that could have been insiders, and we investigate those, because a lot of the questions were, was it an insider? We didn't see any sign of an insider, but we got a lot of indicators that we had to, to watch and look down and then compare everything. So um, all of those things can do. Um, Briefings with the FBI, uh, we found the source, which was a pretty big event. Um, no teams ever find source in these types of events, but we were able to find a, you know, as, as I told you before, it was in a transient virtual machine as part of a build process, a build environment. We actually were able to find one of those build environments that crashed and was backed up. So it was a build environment that was running in March to June. Since it crashed and was backed up, the code was still there. That's how we were able to find the sunspot code that injected the sunburst code. And then we made that public, right? Because 
Yeah, there wasn't something that was that unique about the SunSpark code. Uh, it was a Windows service that was watching for Orion to be built to be able to see what it needed to do. It was obfuscated, wasn't encrypted, um, but that model could, could be and probably is in use in other environments. Therefore, we made it public and made it public to the world. Uh, so that was, um, that happened. We testified for the House and Co House, U.S. House and Senate. Um, you know, governments of the world, the industry programs. Um, you know, essentially we were talking to whoever we could talk to, right? So uh, we have ISACs across, you know, the globe for energy, for power, for finance, for others. So we met with them. We talked to them about the situation. We talked to them about what we knew. We talked to them about what we didn't know. Uh, we talked to them about what was safe. We talked to them about what, you know, essentially as much as we could. Um, we implemented a program to help customers at our, you know, at our cost get off of those affected versions. We revoked our signing cert. Um, now, revoking the signing cert sounds like, hey, that's simple. Just revoke your signing cert. But with revoking the signing cert, one of the things that happened was all of the cert, that signing cert was used for all of our products. Um, hindsight. Not a good idea. We should have probably had multiple signing certs so we could revoke a signing cert and it wouldn't affect everything. But we had to, during all of this, rebuild every one of our products. So SolarWinds has about 50 or so. So we had to go through and rebuild and reship every one of those products at that point in time. And our first conversation with the certificate authority was well, you guys have a week. So a week to build and reship 50 products wasn't going to work, but our teams were working hard to do it. The next conversation, you know, basically I came into this meeting and said, okay, have we talked to them? Well, I said, no, we just, they told us it's going to take a week or two weeks or whatever. That's all we've got, and our cert's going to be revoked. So I, I said, well, let's talk to them. So we talked to DigiCert and Microsoft, um, and the cert, um, uh, the leader of the cert authority was like, no, you have whatever time you need. Our, our path is to be reasonable. All we're trying to do is make sure that the code that was written doesn't run anymore. Um, so they were extremely reasonable. We ended up revoking our cert, not in the middle of January, but in the middle of March. So, uh, but revoking certs were a big part. We started with our, our um, since this happened in the build system, it was important for us to make changes to the build system that made it more resilient. And that, that started in one way and then moved forward. First step was a two-way build process that was shipped uh, with products on January 25th. And that was all products within SolarWinds. So the two-way process is we go from source code, we build the product, we uh, decompile the product, or build the product, install the product, decompile the product, and look back at the source code control system to make sure everything matches, make sure the libraries match, make sure every, the source code matches. And we did that for every product in different forms depending on the language. So we did that within the kind of the first month, January 25th builds. Um, we've gone well beyond that in the build systems. We'll talk a little bit about that in the future, but um, for the, in the build system. We finished the investigation May 21st, published a root cause analysis, had the root cause analysis document, um, checked by third parties, published the third party attestation to say that we've done everything in the root cause analysis. So the months that followed. So one of the things that we came out of this was First, how do we help our customers, and how, how do we help others, right? How do we make sure that others, when they're going through a situation like this, or if they, you know, how can they can avoid situations like this? So um, things like helping others, we published our next generation build system, which is, um, so stage two of the build environment changes were, you know, move everything to AWS, um, not just move it, but recreate it in AWS and only have five people have access to it. Uh, third stage was a multi-stage build process. We, we build three pipelines before we ship, a development pipeline, a verification pipeline, a, a uh, security pipeline. Each one of those has different things that are run on it. We do a binary compare of those three pipelines, and then we never ship until those pipelines all 
equal. Now, it sounds easy, but you know, anybody that does builds knows that they change with time. So we had to invent some things to help with managing time to make all the builds deterministic. So with that, um, we put, brought a lot of that back to open source and gave that to the open source community to say, hey, here's how you can do that. Now, the other part about the build pipelines is no one person has access to all three. So in order to affect my builds today, you need collusions amongst at least three people in order to do that. So again, more resilience in the environment. Um, so develop a plan and tie it all together. Our plan and tying it all together is called Secure by Design. That puts all of the improvements in play. That puts them under umbrella improvement. That puts them under a whole set of things that we do. Um, if you have a cool name, it will be used against you. So, do you know what Microsoft called the Sun SolarWinds attack? No. See, that's your problem. The, the, they called it Nubelium. <laughs> Ever hear of Nubelium? Probably not. So, when you have a name like SolarWinds, it was cool. So, the press, everybody else said SolarWinds attack does this. SolarWinds attack does this. Not the Nubelium who was the attacker did this. So, you'll see SolarWinds get um, attributed to all sorts of different attacks where it was actually the threat actor who attacked SolarWinds did the following. But it's easier to say SolarWinds did this. So, Expect that type of thing to occur. Um, expect additional research to expose the different additional vulnerabilities and things to do. So during this process, um, a lot of people want to attach to this event, uh, a lot of research, a lot of companies. So you'll see, you know, solid research, a vulnerability will be found. It just is what happens during these types of events. So be prepared for multiple builds, be prepared for multiple releases, uh, be prepared for that type of model. Uh, be prepared for hard questions. Um, use as an, as an example to become exemplary. That's one of the other tenets that we had, is how do we become exemplary during this, and how do we do things to allow us to um, really go above and beyond. So build environments, one. You know, my environment, um, visibility was extremely important. How do I get more visibility? So instead of running one sock, I now have three with a follow-on low and slow. So I have CrowdStrike sock that handles workstations and servers. I feed that to SecureWork sock that takes in firewalls, AWS, Azure, application information. My SOC now then fits tertiary to the secure work SOC. Then we have KPMG's forensics team looking for low and slow and threat hunting. So more visibility across the environment, exemplary from where we can be. Um, continually sharing with the community. Uh, the more you can share, the better everybody gets. So continue to do that. So, pivotal event, um, it stored, spurred a lot of conversations for public and partner, private, public and partner uh, partnership. A lot of the changes, especially that we see going on in the U U.S., uh, breach notification laws, executive orders, those things are because of the event. So, the efforts are good, and the efforts are making changes and making us more resilient to those types of attacks. Um, it's increased the level of transparency expected from vendors. So, um, you know, our transparency was kind of like what everybody else was. We give you the basic information, that was enough. But today's information that we'll send is full transparency. We'll explain what products we use to protect. We'll explain our network architecture. We'll explain what we do from a testing perspective. So we, it, it really upped the bar from a vendor perspective. Um, supply chain conversations are everywhere. So, um, yeah, establish new standards, collaborate and contribute to open source efforts, hold the lamp and vigil against threats, advocate for public-private partnerships. And I want to get time for some questions, setting a new standard in software development. So here's some links for our software development environment and some of the secure by design that work that we've done. So. It's been an experience. Happy to take questions in the next five minutes or so. Uh, and feel free to ask anything. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I thought it was very interesting what you said about, uh, you know, your brand will be hijacked by the media and will become the name of the attack.
Not the attacker's name. Right. I thought that was really, really interesting, you know, just like little insight that I never thought about that we call it the solar winds, but it wasn't the solar winds attack. Correct. It was the solar, it was... Attacker. Attacker attack. Right. Fantastic. Let's take a, got a few minutes for questions. Oh. Yep. Could you prevent this attack? It happened. Yep. It happened. No. Uh, right. It, it may be. Do you think, could you prevent this attack? First question. The second one, what happened after FBI investigation with the legal investigation if some, something, um, somebody arrested or something like that? Yep. Good question. So um, could we have prevented it? Um, I could have made it harder. No question. Um, the... You know, it's attributed to the Russian SVR, so it was a, a, a you know, essentially a military mission against us. Um, could I have, I could have made it harder for them. Do I think that they may have found a way and found a way to get in even if I made it harder? Probably yes, I bet they could have. Now, even with the systems in play today, you know, I require collusion between three people to affect my build and a lot of other safeguards to be deployed. I am 10, 20, 30, 40x harder and more expensive to attack today. But am I perfect? No, not at all, right? And I don't think we can ever get to perfection and say, hey, we'll never be able to be, you know, able to um, completely protect against those types of threat actors at that level. So um, potentially, I definitely could have made it harder. Um, the FBI had done investigations, so initially sanctions went to uh, because of this. So sanctions were uh, performed against the you know, Russian government because of the cyber attack. So there were some ramification. Thank you very much for your presentation. A question in regards to uh, legal aspects. So you mentioned that the uh, Russian SVR was behind the attack. Would there have been a different outcome from a legal perspective or, or your actions if it would have been a, a, a non-state actor? Yeah, good, good question. So I think the, um, again, attribution came from US government, not from us, but would the result have been harder? So I think that one of the lessons that this attack shows us that more ransomware attacks will go in the same direction more commercial attacks will go in the same direction. So we have to remember the millions and millions of dollars they spent attacking us, right? They had up to a thousand people working on the attack. They had plans, they had mission, they were there behind it. Now, with the size of ransomware payouts and the size of commercial payout, will you see those types and levels of patient um, thought that's the word that I often use when somebody talks about the attacker is thoughtful. Extremely thoughtful, extremely mission-centric, extremely patient. So do I expect those types of attacks to become more prevalent in the commercial world? Absolutely, not just nation state. Simply because the ransomware payouts make it worthwhile. I invest five million, I get 50 out, um, so it's worthwhile.